Um, well, good afternoon. First of all, can I just say that I've not practiced this talk, so uh, if I make some slip-ups, uh, uh, I uh, am sorry about that. It's just been a bit mad, a bit crazy. The other thing I want to say is that, before I forget and get really in the doghouse, <laughs> I want to say thank you to Libby, my wife, and my family, because they're so very tolerant of all the time that I give to the work that I do on butterflies and, and similar stuff, and it frequently means that I don't spend as much time with them as I actually should be and want to. So I'm really sorry about that, but thank you for being so tolerant and understanding. I really appreciate it. And I guess in a way, if I just start this here, what does it take to start a conservation project in another com a country? I guess this really shows you in a bit, in a way, what I mean by that, because that's how it started. Okay, so whilst I'd been to Corfu way, way back in 1976, that was the first time I went, uh, Libya had also been back in the 1990s, um, and those were our first trips there, and we immediately thought, well, we've got to bring the children. We, we managed to go for a little trip together, and we thought we must take the children, and, and it has been the preferred family holiday destination. Uh, for the Danahars for, for years since. In fact, this last trip for me was my 21st trip there. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's quite a long time. But I mean, it's just a great place to be. Uh, uh, and I always wanted to go back because of the, the wildlife is astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. I mean, every time that people go there for the first time and they see it, they are, they are amazed. Um, in fact, there's a man walking through the door now, Dave Cook. He would testify to that. I mean, he's seen exactly the same. Anyway, um, I guess most people have heard of it through this book. And uh, so Gerald Durrell, yeah, uh, 1956, I think he first wrote this book and it was published, and everybody, uh, as a consequence, then started to get very, very interested in the island. Uh, he actually gave himself a real hard time about that because it drew a lot of attention and more visitors, and he felt, in some ways, that tourism spoilt the island. So if you don't know the island, let's just have a look here. So this is Italy, and there's the boot, and then there, that little dot there, is this part here. Okay, this is the island as a whole. And then, if we're looking at this map here, a larger area, so the Corfu is about there, but so, so imagine you've got here the whole of Europe, and then you've got the whole of Asia here, and then you've got the whole of Asia, uh, Africa here. So there's lots of influences on this one little island, which in, is in part why it's so very biodiverse. It's also true uh, to uh, think about the fact that it's actually very close. Here it's about two kilometres to Albania. This is Albania here, this is Greece here. And um, so it's, it's very continental in its sort of uh, climate. And, and that's such a surprise for most people to go there. I mean, you may have heard that Corfu's the green island. But when you go there, it's absolutely astonishing how, how very verdant it is and very temperate. Anyway, um, so just to let you know, it's about the fifth of the size of Sussex. 39 miles long, it's the longest point, 17 miles at its widest point. Uh, it's just five miles less coastline than we have here in Sussex. Uh, and uh, the highest point is Mount Pantocrator, which is 906 metres, so just under a kilometre above sea level. Um, altitude, so there we are. This is a rather interesting thing. I was telling Bob Foreman, I only just discovered this yesterday. Um, so here we are, this, the very highest point, and this will make a lot of sense to you in a minute. The very highest point is up here. This is where Mount Pantocrator is. And then you've got this ridge here. There's a great big fault, a geological fault that's gone across the island there. And then you have a few little places down here which are a bit higher. But it's not very high, as I say, the highest point is 906. Here's a geology map, and I quite like this because it orders all of the different types of rock in their age. So this here is a Holocene. These Holocene areas here are very low-lying. These are really alluvial river floodplains. So, and then around here you've got miles and a few sandstones. But up here where Mount Pantocrator was, this highest bit, is loads and loads of calcareous rock. It's some of the oldest. This is the oldest here. This is uh, Triassic breccia, which is cemented, cemented scree put together. So, but you can see there's lots of low-lying places. Uh, uh, and weirdly, though, you know, the, the, the big places up here. But this is, I think of this as the, like the highlands, but of course this area, much, much lower, with lots and lots of rivers going through. It's, it's, a, it's strange because you go there and there are poplar trees and there are willow trees, which is not what you expect in a Mediter Mediterranean island. Um, climate, well, let me just summarise it here. Climate of Corfu in the Ionian Sea and Mediterranean is mild rainy winters and hot sunny summers. And the average temperature in January is 14 degrees. 
Uh, and 31 is not actually not that different to here, is it really? <laughs> when you think about it these days. Um, habitats, well, look, here, this is really, you don't really get the effect here, but basically the place is covered with olive trees. 600 years ago, the Venetians paid the Corfits to plant olives everywhere. We don't know what was there before. It would have been really fascinating to know what was there before. You get, uh, you get little ideas every now and then. You know, you find blackthorn or you find hawthorn or elm or oak, which is odd. You know, you find that in between all of these olive groves. Um, but that's basically what it is. It's just a sea of, olive, uh, of greeny silver vegetation with these big cypresses coming through. And, and Edward Lear went out here, the poet and the artist, he went out and he drew it and he painted it. And you can buy those books and it gives you some sense of what it was like. Uh, Fenlands, there are a few Fenlands there. Up in the mountains, there are some pasture areas which are, you know, a few remaining areas left over. Tracks like this with lots of Grieg and McKee either side of them. Some agricultural plots still there. And then on the very top here, you've got this cast topography of limestone, where obviously it's all worn away through erosion and it's very juddery and difficult to travel across. But of course, it, that's really, really interesting from our point of view because not many people go to study uh, anything up there. So that's where we find interesting things. Of course, you would say, Dan, yeah, you'd go and do some work in Corfu because as you go from the UK further and further that way, the butterfly richness increases and that makes sense. But that's not why I went and started doing it. This was me, 27th of April 2014. I had surgery which led to me having to recuperate for 12 weeks. And I thought, well, what, what on earth can I do? It was, it was spring. I was absolutely champing at the bit to get outside and see some butterflies, but couldn't. So I thought why don't I set up a Facebook group in Corfu and see if anybody would send me anything. So that's what I did. I created a Facebook group and I said, I invite you to post your records of butterflies and other wildlife, Gerald Durrell, on this Facebook group. And I have a whimsy about writing a book and the butterflies of Corfu and an atlas of that distribution would be an essential component of that book. Now look, I think, I don't think I realized at the time, it's only a reflection now that I realised that that came about, particularly the Atlas, because of the absolutely incredible work that was going on in this branch at that time. I was never part of the Atlas, uh, Sussex Atlas creation. Well, that's not entirely true. I remember I went to one meeting and advised them on a publisher. But there were people like Bob Foreman and Nigel Symington and uh, Claire and Michael Blenko and Neil Hume forgive me if I've forgotten any, but, but these people did a remarkable job. And I think if anybody who's got a copy of that atlas knows that it's possibly one of the, well, it is, it's, we know it's the best regional atlas in the UK. And it was a fantastic effort that they did. And I, and I, and I guess subliminally, it seemed to me the obvious thing to do in Corfu. So that's what happened. And I thought, oh, great, I'll, I'll put some pictures up of what I've got, what I've seen in Corfu. Lower Skipper, uh, Civil Wash Fertillery, uh, I added loads. <laughs> Nobody added anything to my Facebook group. And I was getting quite worried about this. But then I found on a gardening group in Corfu, a chap had done this. He put this one butterfly up. And I thought, oh, somebody's interested in butterflies. And his name was John Den. And John has, I was going to say a lifelong friend. It, I, obviously, I haven't known him all my life. But it was since 2014. And he's become a really, really good friend. A very, very nice man. And as we started talking more and more, it transpired that John had had an interest in butterflies as a young man, and this kind of encouraged him to start getting interested in butterflies. And it was a, it was a very interesting thing. I'm a school teacher, or at least I'm a retired school teacher, and so mentoring has always just come as a second nature type activity for me. And I was just forever trying to encourage John in whatever interest he had with, with regards to the butterflies, helping him identifying them and helping him, uh, you know, uh, monitor them and, and actually look this is what he found he, this is the number of species that he's found each month in his garden it's remarkable real real you know over 30 species in his garden in June how about this look this is from 2014 to 2016 this is in his garden uh, there are some errors here but 44 species that's what we've got in our county he had it in his garden so this was, you know, just quite remarkable. And um, it was lovely having this dialogue and, 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 and social media was very new to me. So I didn't right, quite get it. But, but what did 
that happened was that slowly I was building relationships with people. And, you know, by the time John had done all of this, there were already like maybe 150 people who were giving data to the... the uh, you really make me nervous, Bob. Bob's scrutinising oh, this. <laughs> See, where are the area. There are errors. Like, for example, I think we've got, what is it, uh, somewhere, the Eastern Woodwhite. And we have never found the Eastern Woodwhite. So there are errors. It was early days. That's my excuse. Anyway, so, um, but yeah, so that's what happened. But what, what was really interesting was that as John and his, his wife, are they married? Yeah, as John and Lynn uh, started getting more and more interested in this, so they started realising that they were kind of doing, an, well, they, I realised they were kind of doing a transect, but they started realising that the more they walked around their garden, the more they began to realise certain things attracted the butterflies. This is uh, Echium candidans, which came from Madeira uh, originally. I don't mean they got it from Madeira, but that's where it grew originally. And it was an incredible... Um, plant to see in the spring. I mean, you, a spike like that, you could easily see 10 green hair streaks on. And they had somewhere in a region of 200 spikes. <laughs> so it was quite remarkable to see that. And so what they did was more and more and more, they started making a whole load of notes about what they were seeing things on. And then they started growing those things in their garden. So over a course of, you know, quite a, a short period of time, they turned their garden into a butterfly garden, which was incredibly valuable. Now, look, this is one of the things which I thought was interesting. If you go back there, sorry, look at that. So that's a big, big one that's the Painted Ladies. And, and here it is, it's because they, they witnessed this massive uh, invasion and migration of Painted Ladies. And you can see there's about 25 of them on the uh, various echiums there. Um, and that ended up being a bit of information, went into a BBC programme that some of you may remember, where they were talking about... And Dave, you were in it, weren't you? You were, Dave was in it as well. I remember the same, Dave was in Cyprus at the same time. And I think Dave's... Oh, Crete, right. And you, so you saw this, didn't you, on the Facebook page? And then he did some stuff and he got on TV about it. Anyway, um, so enter Jason Fisher. Up to now, we'd had, like I say, about 150 people uh, interested in what we were doing. Uh, uh, but not much sort of skill in, amongst that uh, community. It was really great because although Jason was a birder, he actually knew his butterflies. And that was really a, a really wonderful thing because he started contributing in a way that didn't mean that all the responsibility was on me all the time, you know, and, and, and that was a really nice thing. And slowly, we began to get more and more people doing things like that. Now, I would be saying, like, here, we, we were trying to figure out whether or not we had Woodwhite or Eastern Woodwhite. Somebody had recorded it. Actually, it's published in a book. But we have never found any evidence for it in all the time we've been there. In fact, since then, a guy called Co two authors, Kutis and Gavlas, have gone and done genitalia and they can't find any uh, uh, evidence for the Eastern uh, Woodwhite either. But the, this is a book that I would always try to get people to use because it's a key. Uh, Tristan LaFrancis is, and it's fantastic. It's either yes or no. Has it got this diagnostic feature or has it not? And uh, you can get that on PDF. And, you know, I get it on my phone, so if I'm out in a field somewhere in Europe, I can use it immediately. Uh, anyway, and it, uh, and it became a very interesting sort of mentoring experience. This is Bob Giles. He's an ex-policeman and his wife, Tricia, and they live out in Corfu, and they run this community called... Sorry, a Facebook group, group called the, the Corfu Forum, and they've got, like, 40,000 people that are members of that group. And so, you know, they started giving me ideas, and they said, well, you can have this fixed post, and it helps people identify all the different butterflies. We did that. So slowly we were building this level of interest... Bob, I, someone said, oh, look, I found these caterpillars. What are they? And I said, oh, I think they're the glanville fertility. Bob said, I'm going to go look for them. Next thing you, you know, he's come back and he said, I found this. Yeah, it is glanville fertility. Look, they've moved on quite a bit. They're looking great. So it was really nice that there was this amazing dialogue where I was sitting at home and people were going out and doing stuff. And I thought, well, how powerful is this? As a child, 1976, my dad put me on the back of a moped and he drove me up into the mountains, I don't know where, and I saw a southern swallowtail. Only time I had seen one at that point. And I said this, and this is what to look out for. And like two weeks later on, somebody showed me that. Now, think about this. In the old days, if we wanted to find out about the existence of a butterfly, you'd find yourself having to either go there or write a letter, and it would have taken a lot of time. But this was a media, and it, it was a very real connection with uh, an, a, a group of people in a different location, which was immediate and sudden and amazing. So look, this is Yanni Gastaratos, and this is Chris Little. Both of them have become immensely good friends. Yanni's a fantastic birder, 
uh, and Chris is a businessman, but they're both passionate about butterflies as well, and they've really, really helped. And one of my good friends, Peter Sutton, had said to me, do you know, I've been to Corfu, because Peter's been read, writing a book about Corfu since the Hannah Gordon version of the My Family and Other Animals that the BBC did. And he's, so he's been about 20 odd years, he's been going there, writing this book. And he said, I think there might be Southern Festoon there. We've seen, we've got one record. And so we looked it up, and so we, us guys went out to look for it. I mean, within 15 minutes, we found it. Now, this is what I want to tell you about. Look, that looks like Roland Wood, doesn't it? Or something like that. You know, this is, the thing about the, the, the Corfit landscape is, it's like, especially in the spring, it's like being in uh, a temperate woodland, like we would have here, some of the best stuff. It's a temperate woodland plus. It's like Alice in Wonderland. Suddenly, something like that turns up. I thought, in fact, the first time I ever saw that, and it was fluttering around the, the base of some undergrowth, I thought I was looking at a small tortoise shell just for a minute. Anyway, well, we found it, we then found its habitat, we found where it was laying its eggs, we looked, saw its caterpillars a bit later on. We found that this butterfly, this is in April, is nearly all over the island, everywhere. How is it that we were at one point when we thought maybe there was, we'd had one sighting, and then suddenly we realised it's everywhere? And it was because no one has ever gone there at that time of year to look. You know, all of the tourists basically go in the midsummer and that butterfly's not there. So it was this realisation that here was an island that very few people knew very much about at all. And in fact, you know, it's sort of the Darelian... I did write a, a term for this, I've forgotten it now, and I wrote it for the Royal Entomological Society Bulletin, so you can read it there. But there, it's kind of like, it, it's just, it's been this area that no one's ever gone to. Anyway, so there we are. And then sort of these type of trips became regular more and more. This is... Uh, Yanni and Zoe, uh, yeah, they've just agreed to get married and we're going to go to their wedding uh, uh, next year, which is great. Uh, and uh, so we started going to lots and lots of different places. And the great thing about this was that Yanni would know when he saw a large tortoise shell. It was like, not somebody was saying, what is this? He would know, snap, take a photograph. So it w there was some good stuff coming in. Uh, we started to explore. This is up in the mountains. And this, look, this felt like being in the New Forest with suddenly a, a clearing. Not why I expected to be up in the mountains. Uh, and here, of course, is the Southern Swallowtail, which is, you know, really very exciting to see that after uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, and then started seeing new species, like the Hungarian skipper. So this was the first time I had ever seen this species. And I thought it was Hungarian skipper, but then seeing it laying on Sangosorba minor, which, of course, is a plant that I know, was, you know, a really good confirmatory thing. Um, so I remember at the time trying to encourage people in the sausage branch. And I wrote this, remember, do you remember, Bob, you were doing the uh, website at this point, and I remember sending this to Bob, and there's a little comic strip saying, you know, here we are in uh, Corfu, up Mount Pantocrator, and we've got hilltopping scarce swallowtails. And Peter Reels told me, we think these, the hilltop, but no one's got any evidence of this. And so it was this continuous discovery. And that, I think, was, what's, was quite profound, because as a British entomologist, the likelihood that you're going to make discoveries on a daily basis that nobody really knew about is just unheard of, whereas here you do, in foreign territories like this you do. So building a community. One day, one of these people said, who didn't know much about butterflies, what was her name? Jan Wilcox. She said, I've seen this big orange butterfly. Does anybody know what it is? And I, you know, it's a plain tiger. It's really exciting. So she told us where it was. And I, you know, this is in October, I think, and I wasn't there. And so then other people started going. So there's Jan's, and then John Den went, and he, that was very unusual for John. He just he liked to stay to his garden. He went out. Chris Little, who uh, you've met already, he went there, and he had a look. He flew out and had a look. Uh, then somebody said, look what I found. Trisha Giles said, I found this, and what on earth is this? Bob said, what is this all about? And we said, oh, my God, look, it's a, a B-movie poster. It's a praying mantis is feeding on these. Um, and then we got, oh, Jan's going along saying, look, I think it might be laying eggs. And, and I said, well, you know, look out for these. I think I know where we're looking. Look, Bob's saying there's loads of them. This is where we are. Uh, Yanni said, I'm finding one here and I'm finding them here. And I said, look, this caterpillar, you must see those. Nobody could see them. 
but Candida said, look, I've got the butterflies in my garden. I said, sod that, look at that butterfly, that caterpillar. <laughs> so suddenly we were seeing lots and lots of really interesting stuff and it was really getting quite excited. And I was really delighted because I'm at home in England and there's all these people reporting back and telling us about stuff. Um, now, Bob found eggs, found caterpillars, and then John Den took some plant to try and grow it and found there were some eggs on it and he started rearing them through the winter and he called them the Almiras too, a bit like the Beirut prisoners, and they, because it was the Almira speech that they were found, found them on. And eventually this butterfly turned into chrysalis and emerged in February and he released it. And in February you can just about get away with releasing butterflies in February. From that, I was able to make a real estimate. You know, some of these are guesses about abundances here. But I got some idea about, you know, oh, look, that peach there at the beginning of November. And in fact, this is really the trend we've seen ever since. October is the time to see the plain tiger. Some years, like this year, we've not seen very many. But Libby and I have turned up with the kids sometimes in October, got out of the car. There's a big patch of uh, uh, Patricia Vicosa, the uh, very yellowy flower, and loads and loads of these plain tigers feeding on top of it. Now, this was a weird thing, because later on, the council got a great big bulldozer in, and they got rid of a load of seaweed, and they dumped it onto this area where the plain tigers had been. And, of course, these are migratory butterflies. They've come up through Africa, and they're laying their eggs on whatever bit of habitat that they can find. So in many ways, a fairly opportunistic species. And you're thinking to yourself, uh, wow, that's amazing. You know, those butterflies uh, could just about be anywhere. But the people who were on the island, who'd gone to that one spot, and for them it had been, meant something, they made a big hoo-ha about it. And that really surprised me. And I'm saying, don't worry about it, guys. It's not a big deal. I mean, there's probably some bits of that further up the coast. No, they were really, really upset. And that was a, a quite an interesting thing for me because I began to realise that this, this exposure to the natural world in this way had begun to have some real meaning for them. When I was a school teacher, I used to say to kids, bioliteracy, it's the most limited form, know some names of species. Bionumeracy, it's the most limited form, record what you see. So we know what's happening on a sort of yearly basis, a bit like stocks and shares going up and down. It's important to know these things. And then I made up this word, bioempathy. Because if you do these things, you get involved. Like David Attenborough said, you know, no one will really care about anything unless they've really been exposed to it. So this was what was happening. And this whole sense about butterfly conservation was beginning to form in my head. And I asked them, what you've seen up to now is a talk that I gave maybe about three, four years ago at uh, the Linklater Centre. And I asked these people, because I knew I was going to do it, to give some little bits of information about what they felt this was doing for them, this Facebook group. And Jason Fisher said, the best thing about this group is a sense of community where everybody helps everybody else out. And I thought it was fantastic. There are other things up there that you could read, but we will be here all day long and you'll want tea. <laughs> anyway, I thought we need to take this up a step. So the other day when we were at committee, somebody said, you know, this is very much in many ways like an uh, a sibling of the Sussex branch, this project, and I totally agree with that. Because it is, this wouldn't, I don't think this would have happened had it not been for the skill set that I'd learnt through being a committee member and working with different people and being able to make those skills transferable. And at the same time, you might recognise that some of the people, this is Colin Knight, and this is Richard Roebuck and Sarah Canning, and I thought we needed to take these people out to let the Corfits and the resident expats see what it's really like to be with butterfly enthusiasts who really know what it's about they're trying to take a photograph of a butterfly in the field because they're just lunatics they're running around everywhere and going mad to try and photograph them so there we are we went out and we had a great time i mean this was great i'd seen a nettle tree butterfly but i didn't really know what a nettle tree was i um was sitting with these guys having this little drink in between time and i said you know if ever there was a nettle tree it must be that tree there because look at the shapes of those leaves and we all go, yeah, that probably is, isn't it? And then somebody said, yeah, and it's got a speckled wood in it. And then I said, hang on a minute, if that's a nettle tree, that's not going to be a speckled wood. So we suddenly realised that, no, it was a nettle tree butterfly. So then we're all up like lunatics, you know, forget our beer, we're all taking photographs. And then the next thing we do is once we know what we're looking for, we then walk around this place called Old Periphia, which is a really ancient village up in the mountains, looking at where the nettle trees that we've just discovered are, and there 
territorial behaviour is going on with all of these natural tree butterflies. Now, that's a really interesting experience to suddenly encounter a species that you really didn't know and suddenly learn something about its ecology within like half an hour. It was really fantastic. And then we drove into town and suddenly Richard Roebuck said, Dan, stop the car! We jumped out, we looked out, caterpillars, he said, and there were, on the nettle tree there, these caterpillars. I didn't know that they had two different colour morphs in it. And then later on, I went back a week later and found the chrysalis. So this was a really, really exciting part of what we were doing, discovering new stuff, finding new examples of species and learning about their ecology. This is Peter Sutton. I mentioned him earlier on. He's been doing the 28-year survey and he's going to write a book on the natural history of, of, of Corfu. He said to me, Dan, he was with us, just coincidental. I know that down in the Roper Valley that there's uh, a place where I saw a Grecian copper. He said, and they're territorial, so we might be able to find it if we go back. So we went back. It, we found loads. And this was another example of, you know, how we thought that maybe a Grecian copper was immensely rare. But no, they're all over the place. So there was this continuous awareness of what, how much there was to learn. So the question is, how many butterfly species are there in Corfu? So Peter had written already a provisional but meticulous uh, checklist back in 2012, and he, and he said that it looked like it was about 85 species. Uh, uh, Stamatis Guinness, with his peers, had done an illustrated book with some uh, doubtful identifications in that, but he reckoned that there were 70 species. And then, as I said, Garvelis and Kutis, they looked at... Uh, they did a little survey and they thought about 78 species. So, uh, this thing begs the question, what do we not know? Now, actually, I realise there are things about this now that we do know. But here we go. This is what I said before. We're still unaware of the number of butterfly species that there are in, in Kukira, Corfu. Actually, I think we do know. We found 76 species to date. Now, that's easy because if someone says, what is this butterfly? You say on Facebook, have you got a photograph of its underside? Have you got a photograph of the, this from this angle? And they do, and then it's definitive. I mean, you know, unless, of course, it's something that you can't separate other than through genitalia, you know. So 76 species plus. The plus is there because like, only this last year we discovered a new species, so there's always possibilities of new species. That we know. Uh, we don't know about the distribution of all these species over the island. Well, as you will see, actually, we're beginning to. We're beginning to understand about that. Um, we don't know about them uh, when they most commonly fly during the year. Actually, forget that. We do know now. We definitely know about that, and I can say that definitively. Um, we don't know about their popula population sizes. Completely right. We have no idea, really. We know it looks good, but we don't really know much about population sizes. And we don't know how any of these things change. Now, I was just talking to Bob Foreman, how I been drawn more and more and more to finding out about the changes in landscape history in Corfu over the last 18 months, thinking about how that is and what's happened there. And that, I think, is a crucially important thing to uh, try to understand about how butterfly assemblages change over time. Uh, but if you've read my article, oh, here we are, I think I've said this all again, Look, yeah, so we know 76 species plus, we know that the bu butterfly populations look good, uh, as you've seen before. But if you've read my article in the, in the, the butterfly article in, for, from Butterfly Conservation, Diane Fossey started work in 2000, uh, sorry, 1967 at the Rohingya region in Rwanda. She estimated the population size of mountain gorillas at 240. She expected species to become extinct in the year 2000. And today the world population is at 1,004. But, you know, it begs the question, um, surely they weren't always that small in number. And if so, well, why wasn't there, you know, why weren't people aware of that? I mean, or maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But there's this concept of shifting baselines, which I'm sure many of you understand. Um, some rates of decline are so slow that they're not visible during a single human lifespan. So here we go. These are generations or decades. And so if you're born here and uh, you live through this lifespan here, or it's a decade here, you don't know at all that the population size here, a few generations or decades back, was like that because comparing it from one point to the next is not very easy, it doesn't make a big difference. So yeah, this is uh, Daniel Paul, oh, why is that not working? Yeah, fisheries expert, Dan uh, ecologist Daniel Pauli introduced that concept. 
and it's now considered a major obstacle in the public's perception of biodiversity loss. And so if we're concerned about biodiversity loss, the, uh, the question becomes, when do we start monitoring populations of different species? The answer is always now. You have to start right immediately, because you never know what it was like before. And, you, and the only thing that we can do is get a baseline now. So that for us was really, in my mind, thinking we, need, we, we do need to do that somehow. Uh, what do we know about the number of butterfly species found in Kukiri in the past? Well, I, I, like I say, there are lots of things that people have written, but these are all visiting entomologists who've left the, kit, the family on the beach for the day and they've gone up to the mountains and just had a look. We don't know a lot about it. Uh, what do we know about population sizes? Well, you can read bits of Gerald Durrell's book, and look like here, for example, if Tillery is glowing almost as hot and as angry as live coals, skittered quickly and efficiently from flower to flower, cabbage whites, clouded yellows, and the lemon and yellow and orange brimstones, Cleopatra's bumbled to and fro. Well, it sounds like there's lots, but there's no real numbers. So I had an interview with Martin Warren. We were doing some work on the Heath Artillery, and I was filming him, and I was talking to him about this idea. And was telling him about this idea about having an atlas and whatever and, and told him about the group and he said Dan why don't you call it Corfu Butterfly Conservation and it you know to be honest with you that was an idea that was already in my head but I didn't feel I had the audacity to do it but because Martin suggested it felt like a blessing really and I was delighted about that and so we talked about that and we talked about having a Corfu Butterfly Survey leading up to an atlas and it seemed to me that that was the way to go. So, the aims were to encourage a growth of a responsible community of Corfu butterfly enthusiasts, taking Pete Eel's idea about that from his UK butterfly website, uh, to survey the butterflies of Corfu, determine the number of species, distribution and flight periods, to find out the number of communities, sorry, to find out if the butterfly communities of Corfu could be used as indicators of good habitat quality and, if so, help the conservation of other Corfu wildlife, to identify potential losses of species and habitat and inform the Greek authorities about which needs protecting, to publish the butterfly survey results and the conclusions drawn from this data in the first comprehensive Corfu butterfly atlas, to encourage ecotourism outside the main tourist season, bringing extra revenue to Corfu, and for Corfu Butterfly Conservation to eventually become a non-profit making organisation working in partnership with both governmental and non-governmental partners in Greece and the United Kingdom and Europe. God, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> we had high expectations, but we're getting there. Now, what was fantastic was I started working with Sam Ellis. Sam, at that point, he's retired now, but he was the International Director of Butterfly Conservation. And working with Sam was really, really helpful because we knew that we would need some help in structuring how this organisation might develop. We also knew that we needed some help with regards to funding. And uh, Eva Prokop, who was Grants and Trusts Fundraising Manager, both of these guys, between them, put in an awful lot of time to help us raise some money and to do those jobs. Uh, we did an original uh, costings for what, what it might cost to do this. £41,000 was our, was our goal. We had these target organisations uh, or, or sources for funding. There's eight there. Out of, out of those eight, six of them have come up with trumps with some money, which is rather good. And of course then, it was now time to take back another group of, of Sussex butterfly enthusiasts. Or, 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 or Surrey, there's uh, Harry Clark there from Surrey. Uh, Mark Colvin, you might just be able to make out there, and again, uh, Richard Roebuck and, and uh, Colin Knight and Sarah uh, Canning. So all people from l local. And this is what they went out to go and see. I mean, it's, you hear what, two species I think you might know? Glen Artillery, uh, I mean, you might see in the UK, uh, the green hair streak. Oh, you might see that, you might see the large tortoiseshell. The rest of them you're going to see in Corfu. And they're beautiful, and this is just the spring stuff, and it's just astonishing the stuff you can see there. But of course, they were also there to do a really big job and help us support uh, our inaugural meeting at, uh, uh, oh, Fandana Villas this was, it's a 17th century uh, Venetian villa. And Lee Durrell very kindly did a talk for us. Now we must introduce at this point Anne Sordinas, who had been having a communication with us through Facebook, and has turned out to be an astonishing uh, advocate of butterflies in Corfu. As you can see, we had all of our uh, amazing uh, t-shirts on, but she's really, really worked really well and really hard to uh, push us forward. She's, her father was an academic and he worked a great deal on the archeology span of the island. And she went to live in America as a young girl. So she, her English is fantastic, but she's also Corfu and she speaks really good Greek as well. So exactly what we need with regards to having that sort of communication with uh, the Corfu people. 
and, and her passion is real, it's a, a genuine. Um, I also should say is that, you know, I'd have had this dream that I would retire and then go and live in Corfu for at least a year and go see the whole year through and rear some of the butterflies and stuff like that. And then Brexit happened and that all just became, that vaporised, just couldn't do it anymore. But Anne has been there rearing butterflies and really adding to our knowledge, so it's really fantastic. So here we are, all going out. We decided we'd do a provisional survey. This is Harry very kindly did this map of where we went, and that was just good to get a nice feel for the island and to get people really interested. Uh, it, it got the Corpheus interested, so here we are meeting the deputy mayor, and that was you know, putting things on the right track and beginning to make some communication with the Corfeo authorities. And then that happened. <laughs> so you have all these great plans, and before you know it, what do you do? I mean, you know, uh, we wanted to do lots and lots of uh, uh, surveying. The Corfu Butterfly Survey did start on the 21st of January 2020, uh, but hardly any Corfus were allowed out. It was much, much more difficult for Corfus to go out than it was for English people here. I mean, they had to do an SMS text on their, their iPhones and get a response and then show the police at uh, roadblocks. It was that r difficult. And, of course, people couldn't travel very much to Corfu, even though I did. Uh, but every cloud. This was, I mean, who'd heard, I'd never heard of Zoom. I'd never heard of Teams. I'd never heard of any of those things. But suddenly, all the people that were in Corfu were talking to all the people that were in Sussex. And we had this melding. And we could have our committee meetings. And it was astonishing. Suddenly, we had this amazing uh, movement forward with people being involved in the project. Now, you know that Bob Foreman and I have, over the years, done a whole range of different posters of butterflies of, uh, of Sussex, of Brighton, of the Biosphere, and whatever. It was obvious to do this here in Corfu. And Bob very kindly spent hours and hours cutting these out. I went up to the Natural History Museum, Booth Museum. These things take time. People don't realise how much time they take. Thank you, Bob, for all the hours you put into that. Um, uh, but we did it, uh, we knew that we had about 76 species, so we got those together and, and very kindly the Ionian Environmental Foundation sponsored us for uh, 10,000 of those to be printed, far more expensive in Corfu than it is here to do such things. Uh, in the meantime, I was working with our colleagues in uh, Holland and, and Sam Ellis in uh, Manor Yard and we were producing these booklets um, which our identification guides and talk about the survey, the Crawford Butterfly Survey, and they talk about uh, the uh, European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and they tell people how to do it, they show diagnostic features. Actually, at the back there, there are a few of these, they're in Greek and they're in English, there are, there's quite a few posters, and there are some little pins, I haven't got mine on, a little enamel pins by Paul Foster John, and uh, if you want some, and we suggest you make some donations, we'd be very grateful for that, because all of these things uh, cost money, but... So we did these things, and, and they were all ready to be used at the appropriate time. Oh, and there's the pin. There we are. And we got all of it. We wanted to look as professional as we possibly could. Um, and then one of the things, the great things that came out of the work with Sam was he, Sam really, really supported us in our application to the Royal Entomological Society. Now, again, I have to say thank you to Bob, because Bob spent abs maybe two years, I don't know, I can't remember, writing code for the mapping for this. And then we worked with Steve Cheshire, who cloned, because he was a website manager of the Warwickshire branch, he cloned that website branch. And between Bob's work and Steve's work, we managed to get this amazing website for about five grand, I reckon. That's how much it was in total, which most people that use that website say, this, this is a £150,000 piece of stuff. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Steve, who hopefully will see this video when we've done it at the end. So that's what, that's what it looked like. And here you go. Here's the website, all the different butterfly species, uh, there's a mapping, who we are, different bits of information about the species, bits of information about the island itself. The new thing is yet to be developed, but we're still working on it. I'm very happy with it. There's still lots to be done with it, but it's, it's, it's moving forward. But it's active as a portal for uh, learning. Uh, and, it, and it's also in Greek. So you can just click on the flag and it's in Greek. Because why do this is a question that maybe we should have said at the beginning in a way. You know, it's because, in fact, when I go there, there are thousands of butterflies. And I can be here and sometimes, if I'm lucky, I see one butterfly a day. If I want to go see Grizzle Skipper here, I get in my car and drive somewhere. 
Whereas I could go there and maybe just look on the lawn outside the hotel and see a grizzled skipper. And the thing is, is that you and I have seen this change. We've seen the industrialization of our landscape. We've seen how agriculture has changed things. We know that things like neonicotinamides have a massive impact on the, land, uh, on the invertebrates that we have here. And we know that it's so easy to lose it. But the corfits are completely uh, oblivious, really. Uh, they have no idea how incredible their natural heritage is. The whole world knows about the Greek cultural heritage. But very, very few people recognise how wonderful their biodiversity is. So, yeah, that's what it's all about. So here we are, 1st of January 2021. The first person to make a record was Anne Sordinas on the 2nd of January. There it is, Red Admiral. So we were off. Yes. Oh, and by the way, look at this. A little bit later on, we become Corfu Butterfly Conservation, a community interest company. So um, that was a delightful thing because that meant you can have a bank account and that means that we're an organisation and no longer a project. And so our team immediately became a committee. Um, and we didn't do that in Greece because it was expensive and challenging and difficult. Bureaucracy in Greece is really difficult. In the UK, it's 35 quid. And we had an accountant who said he'd do it for free. So I was lucky enough to get two lumps of money to go to Corfu uh, to look for hard to reach species. So we had lots of people recording butterflies in their gardens, but there were things up in the mountains that you know, maybe people wouldn't necessarily go to look at. So this here, uh, so it was a Percy Slade Memorial Fund that gave me money twice in 2021 and 2022. Uh, look, number one, small blue, Mount Pantocrator. This was uh, Harry Clark and Mark Colvin took that photograph. It was the only one that we'd seen. Uh, then next one here, this is Brighton, Butterfly Haven at Liz Williams I'd taken. So you can see pretty much the same butterfly. Matt Rowling's uh, Cupido Osiris, the Osiris Blue, that's that one. And then look, suddenly Mount Pantocrator, this is me, my son Indy and Anne Sordinas. Now to me, that looks like an Osiris Blue. And again, look, here's the Osiris Blue by Matt uh, uh, Rowling's and here Mount Pantocrator, the same one. I don't think they help. This to me looks like a so, but we put this out on the ether. We put it out into all of the Facebook groups in Greece, all of the Facebook groups in Italy. There was no consensus. Many uh, Italians who, there's some really brilliant Italians who know their stuff. They didn't agree that this was an Osiris blue. So it was really interesting. And the trouble was we can't take specimens because we are not allowed to use a net or take specimens in Greece. Um, we have applied for permission but it's been declined. But we were making discoveries all the time. So this is the southern swallowtail caterpillar. And we, we had no idea what his host plant was there. In fact, it is Scaligeria napiformis. That we took, <laughs> in fact, we shouldn't have done that, but we took this when we sent it to Q, and Q identified it for us. We've since found it's on a, a, a popper max as, again, that's a different genus of uh, umbellifer. There are two species of that in Corfu. But you know, it's simple things like this we were beginning to find out about. The Eastern Baton Blue is one of the rarer, near threatened species, and that looked like it was in a real bad way. Uh, but we were beginning to find that all over the island. So it was having the opportunities to do things like this that made a real big difference. The Queen of Spain Fertillery, we'd only ever seen that once. Well, I had, personally, then this guy Bryce Smith saw it, but we then went up into these mountains, his Indy and I, and uh, some of our Corfit friends, went up to these pastures up there, and we found one in every single one of the pastures. So, it, again, very unusual, uh, not really quite clear about the fact that uh, they were there, we didn't know wh how they got there, and we began to think, well, maybe they'd hilltops and the fingal, single female had laid eggs in these various pastures. So in between doing all this stuff, I was also able, although I was given money to go to look for the hard to reach species, also able to give tours for people to get involved. And so there's some English people here, some Corfu people here, and it's just this growing momentum of interest that was, was taking place. So look, these are our first records. This is the 1st of January uh, 2021 to December 31st. Now, look, obviously there are gaps, but if you look down here at the very heel here, there's hardly anything down here. Well, I didn't think that was too bad. You know, after one year, that was pretty good. Um, individual species, here we go. Look, you all know the clouded yellow. Look, now, that there, lots and lots and lots where I was actually working up in the mountains, not very many elsewhere. But look, do you remember I said earlier on, we know a bit about the flight seasons now? 
Here with the, the clouded yellows, so even with small bits of data, you pretty quickly understand what they're doing. So this is obviously by Voltine, uh, and it's, it's there in this, uh, this uh, May, and then much, much later. And this is a very common feature in Corfu. Beautiful weather in the spring, beautiful weather in the uh, autumn, desert in the summer. So although there are butterflies around, the abundances are not nearly as great in the summer as at the other two peaks. Uh, here we go, eastern bat blue again. So look, now suddenly we know it's May and June, but not many spots there. Uh, how about this one here, Lang Shorttail Blue? Not many places, but look, clearly an autumn species. This was really encouraging. I haven't put it up there, but we, one of the most amazing things is that the speckled wood peaks in Corfu in March. For us, it's August. I think that's really interesting. I was talking to a climate change specialist just a week ago, we said, what would happen if we took these species and brought some caterpillars and reared them up and released them here in the UK? Would it, would it change? And he said, no, I think they're hardwired genetically to be able to cope with that type of environment. But it does beg the question, with regards to climate change, is there plasticity in these species? Can our own speckle wood change if it gets too hot? Could it be coming out in the spring more? Could it, well, who knows? It does look like it might be possible. Oh, and here, of course, is the southern swallowtail. So again, this is the most reliable information we've got at the moment, not much on this, this is the, so the first year. We're now in the second year, just coming to the end of it. So look, here we are. Finally, here's a big day. We've got all of these posters printed. This is this year. Yeah, this is this year. We've got all these posters printed and 8,000 of them got sent to the primary schools of Corfu. So every single child in Corfu had one of these posters. Oh, and look, here we had our first AGM. So this is really great because we're beginning to integrate with the Corfu uh, community. Now look, this was my template, what, what we're doing here now. So, you know, have a talk, we have a cup of tea, a bit of cake, we chat with one another. It's just so easy to transfer these things. So here I'm giving a talk about what we've done so far. We, this, if you could read this, it actually says AGM and minutes on it. Here's uh, Sam Ellis, he's doing his bit about how you identify butterflies and there's a whole bunch of people there having a chat in the break. Um, we also had an open gardens event, so there's really lovely great big garden here and if you want to know what they're looking at, it's this, it's a southern small white. This is a thing that everybody's been trying to find desperately on the south coast for the last couple of years. So that's great and that's moving along, we're doing more open garden events. And that led, do you remember John Den in the beginning telling us all about what he had learned? Well, I've been working with John through the spring here and we've managed to put together a whole, there's a whole page now about gardening for butterflies in Corfu, based on what John learned. Um, Jacob Rothschild, who funded uh, our guides, he said to me, Dan, would you like to come along to the estate and tell me how we might be able to uh, begin to uh, do something to increase the butterflies on, on our estate? And so he asked me to make a proposal. We've just made that proposal. We're doing something about strimming because the corfits are absolutely mad about cutting all the wildflowers down. Uh, olive grove management, uh, and also we're going to plant some ornamental uh, wildflowers to see what, if we can get some quantitative information based on what John has told us. Well, we did a butterfly race here. We've done those so many times. So obviously it was sensible to do butterfly races in Corfu. This was incredible, actually because the Corfuits really took to it. So here we are, two different teams, some Sussex people, a load of Corfuits as well, whizzing around like lunatics, meeting the mayor and whatever again, giving out leaflets. At the end here, this is a Corfuit captain in one team, a Corfuit captain in the other, and Zoe Fondaluk, who she wins. Now listen, this woman is mad. <laughs> She's just gone absolutely mad about this, that she's the butterfly queen. Here's Lee Durrell putting the crown on her head. And look, now look, look at these kids. This was on the, uh, the platy tubes. She loves the yeah. queen, so she's got a crown on. She's got a white hand glove with all jewellery and everything. And she's got loads, hundreds of kids learning about butterflies with her at a museum. They're coming to that, yeah. So anyway, so there they all are. I'm, this is me here, and we're teaching all these secondary kids, but all of these primary school kids... Think about that, 8,000 kids have got a post of that butterfly. Look, in fact, look, here you go. These started coming in social media. This kid here, this is Philippos, right? Philippos is the son of a lady that is our waitress when we stay at our regular hotel. And I, and I said, oh, I saw her on social media. Philippus, he's put up his picture of the butterflies. 
She said, yes. And I said, that's great, isn't it? She said, yes. He said to me, Philip was saying, mama, mama, mama. <laughs> mama, mama, mama. I, um, today, all the children in the whole of Corfu, they get a very special poster from a very famous scientist in England. <laughs> she said, no, no, no. He's not famous scientist, he's only Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, so it was fun. It was really lovely the way that you could see that everybody was really getting excited about this. Oh, look, this is great because, of course, for a couple of years now, two, three, four years now, I've been taking groups. And finally, we started talking to Green Wings, and Green Wings said, we've been monitoring what you've been doing. Would you like to do a trip to encourage people to go to Corfu? We would love to support what you do because what you're doing is a little bit unusual. It's not what we normally do. We don't normally have people coming to Corfu uh, to do sort of conservation projects. Well, we could have people go out there on a holiday and, and add. So, yeah, we're going to do that, and that's, that's sort of going from the 8th to the 15th of May 2023. So that was one of our goals, if you remember. That was one of our goals, ecotourism. All right, OK, these are the results as of two days ago. Look, 31,915 butterflies have been seen in less than two years, rec report, re recorded on the site. Uh, on this year alone, nearly 20,000. So the first year... Uh, 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 yeah, first year 10,000, the second year 20,000, so 30,000 butterflies in, uh, alone. Let's, and that's, I think that's incredible. Uh, remember that? That's a, that picture there. I'm sorry these are not exactly the same type of uh, plot, but that's it in August. Bob did that for me in August. So you can see, look, look down here, look now. So definitely getting a lot better. Uh, individual species, I already showed you this, didn't I? So remember, look, there's just a few there, look at that now. Oh, no, sorry. There we go. I think we're beginning to show some filling in here. So this is towards the end of the second year. Yeah, a few spots here. Now we're getting them around here. And these ones here, yeah, here we go. Look, beginning to get a lot more. So I think that by the end of the five years, that issue about distribution is going to become a lot, lot better. Um, yeah, <laughs> my son's laughing because this is our barman. Uh, uh, and our bartender, yeah, and he is definitely good. This, this guy, for me, is quintessentially one of our great success stories. He's a barman, you know, he, he, that's what he did, that's what he likes, to, that's what he does for his job. I've known him for 15 years. But every day now, he puts butterfly records into our work. Every day. He is fourth in that list of people. He's a coffee. I just think that's amazing. And he was never interested in butterflies before. I'm not sure he's interested now, <laughs> but he does it. So that's, you know, it's a, but it's not just him, it's his wife and his children, you know, and so that's a really, really wonderful thing. He's a lovely man. Now, look, I'm coming to the end of the story now, you'll be pleased to know. Um, as I've gone along and we've done these various bits and pieces and you do all of this surveying and you observe and you suddenly start thinking about um, conjecture. What, 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 what am I really seeing? You start seeing patterns and everything. And one of the things that Corfeets do is that before the tourist season starts, which is probably about beginning of May, they, they stream everything. A anything that's in their way. They think it looks ugly and, and inappropriate. But orchids are everywhere in Corfu, and they all get cut down. And lots and lots of host plants for nectar sources and life cycling butterflies, they get removed. And we think that this could be done a bit later on. But we can't really show that at the moment. But it is an issue. And so we're, we're grateful that Jacob Rothschild has given us the opportunity to do some experimentation. This, I think, is fascinating. So look, 600 years ago, Phoenicians said, let's plant olive, olives everywhere and we will give you tax incentives. There's like three to four million olive trees in Corfu. Uh, in the last 30 years, only, it seems, they've started cutting them like this. And this is having an incredible uh, uh, impact, really, on sets of butterflies like this. I mean, we all know that at uh, Roland Wood or even at, oh, where is it? Rural, rural Wood, where we've got all of the chestnut, sweet chestnut. And Neil's told us a million times, cut down the sweet chestnut, and suddenly you're going to get all of those pearl border We know that. And we know that it, it, it works really well. 
Well, the olives, it's exactly the same thing. So it's not the species of tree that matters, it's about what happens in terms of the structure of the woodland and the way that that affects light intensity and temperature at the ground level. So all of these butterflies really respond very, very well to that type of management. Here we are up in, uh, up in the mountains, and I told you about the uh, Queen of Spain fertility. This is the uh, small blues, I've got to tell you, small blues are so hard to find in Corfu until this year, there's a bit of cow pat here and suddenly we found about 20 on one cow pat. And it's all about habitat, you know. These bits of habitat here, right, this is the only places where we started finding mazarine blues. These bits of habitat, the fragments of pasture. Now, as I understand it, we, met in, we bumped into a shepherd. He said he had 20 cows up there. He used to have 200. And what happened was, was that when the EEC, when Europe, sorry, Greece started to join the EEC, they could suddenly import milk and feta cheese at a rate which was much, much cheaper than what they could locally produce. So all those shepherds, who were smelly and horrible because they were with goats all day long, what was the point of that when they could go and become doing all this work for tourism and get loads of money and their life be much, much better? So there's been very real changes in landscape as a consequence. And you know, these are the types of impacts that obviously people won't be aware of the impact on their, their native flora and fauna. Here we are, well, this is an, a, a disputed region called Eremites. It was up for grabs, it had been sold and they wanted to develop it. It was amazing natural uh, coastline, no biodiversity surveys. Mainland government were keen to have it developed. The local people didn't want it to happen except for a few people who wanted jobs. So we took out a whole bunch of people to do a uh, survey for one day. We were on it and then suddenly this happened. Five different locations, because we publicised it, five different locations are arsonists burnt it while we were on it. And we, the only reason why we got off of it was because local fishermen saw that we were on the coast in trouble and they came and picked us off and took us off. So very controversial. Never in my life has anyone tried to kill me before. That will go in the book. <laughs> but what was interesting was, was that the crown of thorns or Jerusalem thorn bush grew back really incredibly uh, uh, abundantly. And it's not a very common uh, plant in Corfu. This butterfly, the little tiger blue, up until very recently, I was the only person to see that on the island this century. Before that, 1985 was the, the most recent. This year, somebody has seen it here. So is fire? A thing about that butterfly's ecology. In Corfu, for obvious reasons, they try to stop fire because they don't want their property to burn. But the more you stop it, the more you're sort of storing up for the future. Because if there's no small burns, then suddenly you could have one big one. So it's really interesting. Fire could be an interesting part of that. Look at this. This is, this is Palia Castrizza. This is where my family go most times we go to stay there. This is a lovely little flower meadow two years ago this year. So, the monastery at the top decided they would charge for people to use their car park. Or the rest of the coffee said, oh, you can make money out of parking, can't you? Yes, of course. This was the only site that we found a new species of butterfly, the Mediterranean uh, skipper, Gigenis nostradamus. Since then, we found it in other places, but it makes you realise how vulnerable Corfu is. And what we want to do is give the Corfuits information so that they can make informed decisions about what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and there it is, Gigenis Nostradamus. One unfortunate thing, I told you earlier on, we were declined um, opportunity to get a permit to take specimens of butterflies. Not that we want a, to make a collection, but we lined up Vlad Dinka from Finland and Leonardo Di Porto from Italy and Roger Villa from Spain. These are people at the top of their game. They were very keen to do uh, barcoding of all the coffee butterflies, but it was declined. So that's one thing that we haven't been successful about, but we have been successful about this. So here's Nigel, Nigel Simonton, because <coughs> no, you've got to use your resources where you can. Nigel led on the development, uh, uh, the business development of the Sussex Atlas, and so we're using, picking his brains and using all of his business uh, acumen to help us with doing the Atlas. Uh, we're working now with uh, Pisces Publications, uh, this is uh, Peter Creed, and we've had an agreement for our last committee meeting that they're who we're going to use, just like the Sussex <coughs> Atlas. And I and Anne Sordinus are going to co-author it 
with some other people. We've already started doing the writing. So we're two years in, five years before the end of the survey, we see another four years and it'll be published, we hope. So, future of butterfly conservation, coffee with butterfly. We hope to have a conference, maybe, at some point. A successful completion of this survey and publication of the Atlas. Continue of the survey and establishment of standardised transects. Yeah, because we don't know anything about abundances. We won't know anything about abundances until we set up standard transects, but we won't be able to do that until we convince people that it's a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, what could you do? Well, if you want to participate, you could help by going on the Green Means thing. They give us 10% of their profits, and it helps with the survey. If you're in a position to donate funding to the project, that would be great. Uh, if you live in Corfu or you travel there, please add stuff to our sightings page. I never realised how many friends I'd make. This is our, what, third, fourth wedding? <coughs> third or fourth christening? It's lovely when you're part of a community like that. Uh, and they're such lovely people. Um, thanks to everyone I've mentioned, uh, uh, all these different organisations, but particularly I must end up on thanks to these people. These are now the Corfu Butterfly Conservation Committee. We meet regularly via Zoom. Without these people doing all their various jobs, they've all got subcommittees, some working with the municipality in terms of uh, connection, some with uh, um, Atlas Works, some with developing, oh, developing roles for um, uh, con uh, community officers to work in Corfu. All of that is going on behind the scenes. And by the time the Atlas is done, I want to be able to walk away from it all and it just be like a little baby that's just beginning to walk on its own. Thank you for your patience. You've really been great. Uh, thank you. Any questions? I did actually have a question, which was um, on, your, on the recording, you know, it was mostly in the mountainous area. Is that recorded effort? Yeah, that was me looking for the, uh, the, the weird stuff up in the mountain, you see. Right, it's not because that's particularly good habitat. Well, it is good habitat, yeah, yeah. But I knew that the, lots of people wouldn't go there, and so it was an obvious thing to do. Yeah. Oh, sorry, because I don't know where the sort of um, main towns are. Yeah, that was just me, yeah. But, so I don't do so much of that now. Most, most of what you see now is other people. 127 recorders we've got now. People are ready for tea? Okay, yeah, wrap that up. Thank you very much.